We're now going to take a look at the anatomy of the shoulder joint using this uh, specimen of a left shoulder. It's partially disarticulated. We're going to get into the shoulder joint in a moment, but let's just have a look at its relationships uh, from the front. Now, there is the capsule of the shoulder joint seen from in front, and this is, of course, the left collarbone. And just below the collarbone is a part of the scapula, which is the coracoid process. And through the capsule of the shoulder joint, through this great big hole in the capsule of the shoulder joint, you can see this glistening surface. And that is part of the head of the humerus, the ball in the ball and socket. Now, further medially, we are on to the anterior surface of the scapula. And coming off from the front of the scapula is this very large, powerful, multi-penate muscle, which is subscapularis. It's been divided here, but subscapularis runs in front of the capsule of the shoulder joint, and then it blends partially with the capsule of the shoulder joint, and its tendon, which you can see here, attaches to the front of the lesser tuberosity, the anterior rotator cuff muscle. And then we're now going to look at the upper aspect of the shoulder joint and coming off from the upper surface of the scapula on the posterior aspect above the spine of the scapula is this bipennate muscle, quite a powerful muscle, which is supraspinatus, the abductor of the shoulder joint. Supraspinatus crosses above the capsule of the shoulder joint, beneath the acromion, and attaches to the upper surface of the greater tuberosity. You can see its severed tendon here. And now, to turn the shoulder to its posterior aspect, now arising from the back of the scapula, below the spine of the scapula are two muscles, both of which are rotator cuff muscles. The medial one is the larger one, the multipennate, powerful infraspinatus, the external rotator of the shoulder joint. It runs obliquely behind the capsule of the shoulder joint and its tendon attaches to the back of the greater tuberosity. And the other muscle coming off from the back of the scapula actually arises as a strip from the posterior surface of the lateral border of the scapula. It crosses behind the capsule of the shoulder joint just below infraspinatus and attaches below infraspinatus on the greater tuberosity. Now, we're going to move the head of the humerus away from the glenoid fossa after having entered the shoulder joint. So we're going to enter the shoulder joint and move the head of the humerus away from the glenoid fossa the instantly recognizable large head of the humerus with its glistening surface, which of course is uh, because of the hyaline cartilage covering that surface. And on the medial aspect, the rather shallow, small glenoid fossa. So you can see at a glance the discrepancy between the size of the head of the humerus and the area on the glenoid fossa. You might expect this joint to be a very unstable joint, a great big head articulating with a fairly small glenoid area. However, there are quite a number of stabilizing factors and the shoulder joint is in fact quite a stable joint. So what are these factors which stabilize the shoulder joint or the glenohumeral articulation as it is known officially? One of the factors is this rim of fibrocartilage called the glenoid labrum. It serves to widen and deepen the glenoid area. And arising from the upper aspect of the glenoid labrum, within the capsule of the shoulder joint, is the tendon of the long head of biceps. So those are two important factors contributing to the stability of the shoulder joint. There are a couple of other ligamentous factors besides, and all in all, the shoulder joint is quite a stable joint. I, for one, for all the cricket that I have played in my life, have never dislocated my shoulder joint. Thank <laughs> you.